Hello, this is Dr. James Camp from Lee College in Baytown, Texas, and this is my lecture on three kinds of muscle tissue. So there are in your body three very different kinds of muscle. Found in your heart, of course, is the cardiac muscle, which exhibits striations, uh, but also so has some things that look sort of like giant striations or super dark striations that are called intercalated discs, and we'll get into what those are in a minute. Found in the voluntary muscles that move your body, maintain your posture, and, and let you breathe are the skeletal muscles, which are organized into much thicker fibers, uh, which also exhibit striations but do not have the intercalated discs and do not have the branching that you see in cardiac muscle. Finally, in all of your involuntary uh, internal organs that need to either move food through your digestive tract or adjust the size of an airway or a blood vessel or even make your hairs stand on end in your uh, integumentary system, we have smooth muscle, which is called smooth because it lacks the striations that the other two have and also has um, very long, thin cells that are quite different in appearance from the other two. Okay, so before I try to contrast the two kinds of muscle tissue that we haven't been studying in this unit, uh, up till now, I want to remind you some of the key features of skeletal muscle tissue. First off, you have long, thick, straight, parallel muscle cells or fibers that run the whole length of the fascicle. They can be 100 micrometers in diameter and much, much longer than that, uh, even you know half a meter in length. Uh, students often uh, get the question wrong, uh, what is the largest cell in the body? And they'll, they'll try to think of something that's just a very big round cell, like a, a human egg cell or something. But I would argue that the skeletal muscle fiber is easily the largest because it's, uh, you know, up to, as I said, up to about half a meter long by 100 micrometers in diameter. So uh, those, are, those are gigantic cells. Each fiber is ultimately formed by the fusion of many smaller cells, and so it retains multiple nuclei. Also, you'll notice when you look at skeletal muscle tissue that the nuclei are all pushed to the edge of the cell, uh, pushed out of the way, as it were, to allow the contracting machinery as much room to do its its work as it needs. Um, the actin and myosin that make a skeletal muscle contract are organized into structures called sarcomeres that have a repeating light, dark, light, dark, light, dark pattern that create what we call a striated appearance. And finally, you may remember, this is not shown in this diagram, but each muscle fiber or, or cell has its own neuromuscular junction, which means in theory they can contract independently. Now you also remember that they're typically organized into motor units, so they don't contract completely independently, but you can have as few as say 10 muscle fibers contracting at once out of hundreds in a muscle. So um, you can dial in different strengths of contraction by uh, by stimulating individual motor units, which, which are small collections of muscle fibers. I'm not going to get into the physiology of skeletal muscle contraction, um, except to just summarize, we have that whole cross bridge cycle, you remember, where uh, the myosin grabs the actin, pulls it in towards the center of the sarcomere, uh, 
and as a result, all of the sarcomeres shorten. And to remind you that the, the way excitation and contraction are coupled in a skeletal muscle cell is that the neuromuscular junction releases acetylcholine, a uh, brief, very brief um, action potential spreads along the muscle fibers sarcolemma and down into its T tubules. And so calcium is released into the cell. And you remember calcium binds to troponin, which moves tropomyosin out of the way, which allows actin and myosin to get together and do their dance of, of contracting the cell. So hopefully you remember all of those things that I just said because we've been talking about them for, uh, for some time now. Uh, cardiac muscle has some distinct differences, but is more or less like skeletal muscle with a few differences. It's still striated. It still has myosin and actin organized into thick and thin filaments. It still relies on calcium binding to troponin to move tropomyosin out of the way to allow it to contract. All of those things are still the same. It's still got T-tubules and sarcoplasmic reticulum. All of those things that you've learned about skeletal muscle still apply. Here are the main differences. The cells are not the full length of the muscle. They're about a tenth the diameter of skeletal muscle fibers, so you know, 10 to 20 micrometers in diameter, and they are 50 to 100 micrometers in length. So uh, not even a uh, tenth of a millimeter um, or, or up to a tenth of a millimeter in length. That's obviously not the whole width of your heart, right? Um, so you're going to need multiple multiples of these cells to make up a heart. To help the, com them communicate with each other, which is an important part of cardiac muscle cell physiology, these cells are branched. So one cell might connect to one, two, and also three, and you know, another cell over here, which, which then in turn connects to one, two, three, other cells over there. So uh, this branching is an important way of, of spreading out the communication network between these cardiac muscle cells. They also typically have a single sing central nucleus. You can see in, in this case they've drawn an example of one that actually has two nuclei that occasionally happens in cardiac muscle cells, but uh, but typically each cardiac muscle cell has only a single nucleus. And unlike cardiac muscle cells, you'll notice that the nuclei are, you know, right in the middle of their cells. They're not pushed to the side like skeletal muscles. Calcium comes in from outside the cell as well as from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. We'll talk about that on the next slide with physiology as well, but uh, or explain how that happens on the next slide. But the point is that cardiac muscle cells do not store all the calcium they need inside them. Um, so they're much more dependent on calcium coming in from outside the cell to make the contraction work. Uh, this is interesting clinically, if, if you're interested in, in clinical medicine, because one of the ways that we try to decrease you know, excess cardiac activity, if you've got too, too high blood pressure or something like that, is, is to give the patient calcium blockers that um, block a portion of the calcium channels that let calcium into the cardiac muscle cell. And so that doesn't stop the heart from beating, but it weakens the contractions a little bit so that if, if you have a problem of, of excessive muscle contraction, you can, you can weaken it with calcium blockers. Finally, adjacent cells are joined by these funny things called intercalated discs. 
which are made up of gap junctions and desmosomes. If you imagine the plasma membrane of one uh, cardiac muscle cell being here and the plasma membrane of another cardiac muscle cell being there, the two ways that they're joined at this intercalated disc here, uh, one is by what's called a gap junction, which is a set of proteins that form a channel between the two cells. This means if you have, say, sodium ions that are rushing into this cell to form an action potential, they can rush sideways into the next cell and start an action potential here as well. And that's what I was talking about with that communication network between all of these branch cells, is that they can communicate with each other in, in ways that, for example, kick off contractions in neighboring cells. The other major way that these are connected is with desmosomes. Let's see if I can find a color. Yeah, there we go. Um, which are sort of like the protein versions of, of the couplings between train cars. If you've ever seen the way train cars hook together with these little hook-shaped uh, pieces of metal that, that clink one, you know, uh, link one train car to the next. These connect into the, the striated uh, myofibrils in, in each muscle cell so that as, as this muscle contracts and this muscle contracts, they don't rip apart. They actually pull on each other and cause the whole part to contract at the same time. Now let's talk about how cardiac muscle is different physiologically. The first major difference is what we call automaticity. Um, you see the word automatic in there, right? Uh, cardiac cells are not stimulated by the nervous system, but by autorhythmic pacemaker cells. So you might have, um, or you do have, a little node full of these pacemaker cells, and they produce action potentials on a, a tight schedule, perhaps uh, 100 times a second, or uh, no, not that, that's too often. Uh, perhaps 100 times a minute is what I meant to say. Uh, and then you have your branched cardiac muscle cells coming off from here. Uh, and they carry that action potential off to their neighboring cells and the, uh, the contraction then spreads out or the action potential spreads out throughout the cardiac muscle unit. Uh, plateau potential if you remember what a typical cardiac action potential looks like or what a typical action potential looks like, we haven't gotten to, to that actually because we cover action potentials when we talk about the nervous system. Um, but a typical action potential would, would spike like this and then immediately come back down like that. And then if you looked at the muscle contraction that resulted from that, it would form a nice short buildup and then short breakdown of, of muscle tension, what we call a twitch. Okay, if you look at the contraction of a cardiac muscle cell, the, uh, the brief spike happens, but instead of coming right back down, it's stabilized by uh, a long period during which, well, it's a few hundred milliseconds, not, not that long, but a period during which calcium channels are uh, allowing uh, 
positive charges into the cell, positively charged calcium ions. So that balances out some of the, the uh, repolarization activity that would be happening. And in fact, you, you then wait until um, almost a third of a second has gone by to turn off the action potential and repolarize the, uh, the cell. This graph will make much more sense to you after we've talked about action potentials in ANP1 and uh, when we come back to visit it in ANP2. But for now, what you need to know is that we've got this, uh, this long plateau period here during which calcium ions are entering the cell. Okay, and that means that when we look at the contraction that happens here, it builds up to a certain amount and then it lets go. But it stays contracted for, uh, again, you know, not quite a third of a second. Unlike the twitching that we saw from, cardi from skeletal muscle cells. So unlike skeletal muscle cells, cardiac muscle cells do not have twitches or summations or tetany. They always contract for the same constant amount of time which is exactly what you want from an organ like the heart that has to constantly push the same amount of blood out of the heart and around the body. Now the nervous system can tweak the force of that contraction uh, a little bit and it can tweak how often those contractions happen, the, the heart rate. Okay, we may always contract for about 250 milliseconds, but we can have four of those 250 millisecond contractions every minute um, or every second um, and, and get a very high heart rate and, and push a lot of blood around the body, or we can slow it down to just one 250 millisecond contraction per second, you know, a rate of 60 beats per minute, um, which is about as slow as your heart rate is ever supposed to go. Um, and that would relax your body a lot and slow down the, the flow of blood. So we don't actually really change the heart contraction pattern, the cardiac muscle cell contraction pattern as much as we change the rate at which this pacemaker node here fires new contractions. So it can release, boom, then wait a little while and then another one, or it can go boom, 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 uh, very rapid fire to, to increase the heart rate. Um, Wave-like spread. So since these action potentials that I've drawn as little light green arrows spread from one cell to the next through gap junctions, that means that um, you only need one pacemaker node and eventually the entire heart will get the signal. And this also means that there are no motor units. We don't have a bunch of little pacemaker nodes and each one connects to a different part of the heart. Really, we have, we have one pacemaker and the, uh, the action potential eventually spreads throughout the entire heart muscle so that the cardiac muscle tissue always contracts as if it was one enormous cell. Okay, now there's a caveat to that. You actually do have multiple chambers of the heart and each one contracts a little bit independently from the others, but, uh, but within one heart chamber, it's as if you have one enormous cell that is, that is contracting all, at, um, all from one individual stimulus. Okay. So cardiac muscle is fairly easy to understand then. Let's talk about smooth muscle. Smooth muscle cells are spindle shaped. That's what everybody says. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't interact with things called spindles very often in my life. So um, I like to think of them as being shaped sort of like squashed footballs. They're, they're narrow at either end and a little bit thicker in the middle. Uh, they're about half the diameter 
of a cardiac muscle cell and about twice its length when they're relaxed. They always have a single centrally placed nucleus. They have no myofibrils and no sarcomeres, so there are no striations, and that's why they're called smooth muscle, is that they don't look under a microscope like they've got little cross hatchings throughout them. And like cardiac muscle, adjacent cells are often joined by gap junctions, uh, as you can see in the, the picture that they've the inset picture that they've drawn on this microscope graph here. Um, the gap junctions connect neighboring cells so that they can all contract at the same time. I'm going to leave off a few of the details of the differences between smooth muscle and, and skeletal cardiac muscle, um, but let's focus on the main ideas here. Uh, there are no T-tubules and there is only a sparse, loose network of sarcoplasmic reticulum. So we do not have the nice, tightly ordered system of delivering uh, electrical conduction and uh, calcium signaling that we had in the skeletal muscles. As a result, smooth muscles tend to contract on a much more slow and deliberate basis. They, they, don't, they don't twitch, okay? Um, Thick filaments, myosin, okay, um, they're shown here in this diagram as if they're all connected to each other. They come together for contractions, but when this muscle is, is released, when the contraction is released, um, really these myosin filaments will, will let go from this area and, and kind of scatter a bit throughout the cytoplasm, okay. Um, the thin filaments, actin, are connected to these spot welds called dense bodies. Okay, and what happens when the muscle contracts is that the myosin comes together with the actin in a focused contracted area and that pulls set a, a set of dense bodies so our dense bodies are normally spread out a bit they get pulled closer together by the contraction and so uh, smooth muscles do not contract in a, a simple lengthwise fashion like skeletal muscles and cardiac muscles do they contract um, in, in a three-dimensional fashion where, um, yes, they shorten this way, but they also kind of spiral together in these other directions. Um, which makes the whole thing squish down like a deflated ball or something. And finally, there are these intermediate filaments that you can see drawn in, in purple on this diagram that link all of the dense bodies, and that's how the contraction pulls the cell into a smaller shape, is by yanking on all of the intermediate filaments. Physiologically, smooth muscle is even more different. Okay, it's loosely connected to the nervous system. And when I say to the nervous system, we're talking about the involuntary parts of the nervous system this time. Uh, motor neurons that connect to skeletal muscles are frequently voluntary. I won't say always because um, your breathing muscles are skeletal muscles and you, you don't always get to choose whether you breathe or not. Um, your postural muscles are uh, skeletal muscles and your body sort of learns to automatically adjust your posture rather than you having to think every moment about, am I standing up straight or not? Um, but typically, skeletal muscle contraction is voluntary. Smooth muscle concentration, on the other hand, is always involuntary. You cannot think to yourself, um, I want the hairs on my 
uh, neck to stand up right now so that I look, you know, ferocious and threatening. Um, that's an involuntary response to certain kinds of stress, to part of what we call the, the fight or flight response in that case. Uh, you can't think to yourself, it's dark in here, I want to dilate my pupils. That's going to happen eventually as part of um, your body's autonomic reflexes, but you can't control it voluntarily. Um, Smooth muscle is typically linked together as either part of a, what's called a multi-unit structure, which works sort of like the motor units we talked about in uh, skeletal muscle, where you have maybe a few dozen nerve endings that connect to a few hundred smooth muscle cells, and um, each mu muscle cell gets a, a stimulation that causes it to contract. Uh, you would see that in things that your body has an interest in uh, kind of finely tuning, like, uh, as I was just saying, the, the contraction of your eye muscles that uh, dilate or constrict your pupils or focus your lens. Uh, Multi-unit structures are also seen in the, the erector pili muscles in your skin that make your hair stand up. So things like things that do more typical muscle kind of activities. Uh, most of the smooth muscle in your body, though, is part of what they call a visceral sheet, which is where a whole uh, tissue layer of your blood vessel or your uh, intestine or something like that is made up of smooth muscle. And all of those smooth muscle tissue are connected by gap junctions. You know, all the smooth muscle cells are connected to each other by gap junctions. So really you only need a few points of connection to the nervous system and the entire uh, smooth muscle will, will contract or relax. Um, changes in smooth muscle contraction or relaxation can also be triggered by hormones. Um, or by chemical changes. For example, if a tissue starts running out of oxygen, um, the, the low oxygen state will actually cause its smooth muscle cells in its, in its blood vessels to relax and dilate those muscles so that more oxygen can get into the tissue. Um, most of the calcium for smooth muscle contraction comes from outside the cell rather than from the SR. So it's very important for your smooth muscle, muscle, smooth muscle activity that you get a, a proper dose of calcium in your diet, that, it's, that there's a proper bath of an extracellular calcium there for them. Uh, the uterus, the uterine muscle that uh, pushes babies out during labor is smooth muscle. And so uh, very typically, uh, if you give birth in a hospital, the, uh, the IV solution that they give you to help you stay hydrated and energized will not just have saline and sugar in it, it will also have a healthy dose of calcium to make sure that your uterine muscles don't run out of that extracellular calcium that they need to contract. Calcium binds to calmodulin instead of to, um, anybody remember what it was in skeletal muscle? Uh, it was troponin, okay. Uh, calcium binds to calmodulin instead of troponin, okay. You remember troponin moved tropomyosin, which unblocked the actin head, the, the actin binding sites. In smooth muscles, calcium binds to calmodulin which activates the myosin heads. So in, uh, in smooth muscle, it's the myosin that has to be turned on rather than the actin that has to be unblocked. So this is really quite the opposite method of uh, controlling muscle contraction. And you start to kind of get the impression that smooth muscle and skeletal muscle um, evolved quite differently 
at some point way, way back in the history of animal kind, um, because they clearly use very different, they may both have actin and myosin, but they have very different ways of organizing them and very different ways of turning them on and off. Finally, there are a couple of little uh, peculiarities of smooth muscle that don't apply to any of the other kinds of muscle. Um, pace setter cells, sort of like um, the, the pacemaker nodal cells in cardiac muscle, can trigger rhythmic contractions in uh, smooth muscle. So for example, an, an ex excellent example of that would be um, the mixing motions that the smooth muscles in your intestines do to try to keep your, your food getting evenly mixed with the digestive enzymes so that you don't end up with one spot of, of food getting well digested and another spot of food not getting digested at all. So that, that's a rhythmic contraction of those uh, smooth muscle cells that keeps mixing and remixing your food. Uh, also, most smooth muscle cells exhibit a uh, something called smooth muscle tone, which means that even if they're not getting stimulated, they're contracting to some extent. Okay, again, this probably applies more to those visceral smooth muscles than to the, the multi-unit ones that act more traditionally like muscles that, you know, if it stimulates, it contracts. If it's not stimulated, it relaxes. Um, this is more like the, uh, the smooth muscles of your blood vessels that, that maintain a small amount of, of tone most of the time. If there's a lack of oxygen, they can dilate a little bit to let more blood through. If there's a need for blood to go somewhere else in your body, they can constrict. Or if there's a need for more blood pressure, uh, they can constrict. Uh, but they've got a, a standard amount of contraction that they, they start from um, called their smooth muscle tone. Okay. So that is the main points that you need to know about cardiac and smooth muscle and how they relate to what we've been learning the rest of the chapter about cardiac muscle. Uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, as always, happy studying, and I'll see you in the next lecture.